loud. And we are recording. If you have any moment where you think you need to speak frankly and you don't want it recorded, just tell me to stop recording, okay? Um, because sometimes the things we say may not exactly reflect exactly what we're feeling, but we can't find the right words and we may sound awkward. So if you need me to stop recording, I will stop. So this uh, workshop should take a, about one and a half hours. We've spent the first 10 minutes getting to know each other. That's really important. So thank you for all your shares um, and to the audience out there. Sorry you missed that, but I wanted to keep it a little bit private. And you will be able to share this recording with your members if you wish. So that's me. Uh, that looks pretty much like me right now. And I live in Sudbury and that's enough about me. So today, by the end of the workshop, you should be able to demonstrate citizens' climate lobby core values and articulate our five levers of politi building political will. You should be able to understand and highlight the benefits of carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments. And you can discover how to get involved in your local chapter's advocacy and prepare for a meeting. This is basically what we're doing. Introductions, quick overview, carbon pricing, our values, five levers of political will, planning your meeting, and questions and practice time. And I just want to do a shout out for the man there on the right in that photo. That's Jacques Kenjiko, Kenjio. And he is helping me with the Francophone volunteers in Africa, uh, get them to price carbon pollution. We're having a blast on WhatsApp with them. There's some really neat things going on in Africa, if you ever want to hear those stories. So our solution to climate change is democracy. And thank you for being on our team. Quickly, uh, it, our organization was founded in 2007 in the United States by Marshall Saunders, and I will show you a slide of him in a moment. We have over 550 groups globally, including over 100 chapters outside the USA, and about 40 of those are, Canada, are in Canada, I think, because it's so hard to tell when people quit and when people join back up again. But that's okay. We're, we're hovering around 40 now, which is amazing, and I think we've got well, I think we're pushing close to 120 ridings covered by our volunteers. And what we do is we connect and we engage in our communities. This is our founder, Marshall Saunders. He, he, um, he realized after giving a whole bunch of climate reality presentations that people like you and I were going to have to get organized and give up our hopelessness and gain the skills to be effective with our government. And he passed away in late December and he has this beautiful dream that, and he knows that we can do this. He just knows we can do this. There is no choice. He believes in all of us or he believed in all of us. And I can't thank you enough for being part of Marshall's dream. I met him a decade, almost a decade ago. Amazing human being. I wish you all could have met him. And I know you will all do good by him and his organization. So I have taken the old workshop and I've cut it down quite a bit, but I've taken key things that really spoke to me. E.B. White was an author. He wrote Stuart Little, Charlotte's Web, and he also wrote a book about how to write well. And he was a philosopher. And he has this quote, it's much longer than this, but he says, I arise in the morning torn between a desire to save the world and a desire to save it. This makes it hard to plan the day. Well, we encourage you to savor it first because we need your energy and you need your energy to save it. And what I love about Citizen Cl Citizens Climate Lobby is it's so focused on an actions that help us move forward together that it gives me the peace of mind that I'm working with others. And also I know that other groups are doing things that I can actually let go and go for long walks in the woods and all the things I need to do to recharge my batteries. And I hope by the end of this workshop, you feel that same way too. 
Mark Reynolds over the years has reminded me over and over again that focus is our superpower at Citizens Climate Lobby. So today you will learn about many things that you can do to build political will for carbon pricing in your riding, and you might feel a little overwhelmed, but at the end of the day, your primary job is to build a relationship with your local parliamentarian. For some of you, that's gonna mean both provincial and federal. Um, so think about, but prior to prioritize federal first, um, and then go to provincial, but think if all you can do is federal, that's okay and then around carbon pricing. So that's that's your primary job is to get that first meeting and then the second meeting and the subsequent meetings so you build a relationship. I'm gonna do a quick hop, skip and a jump on carbon pricing in Canada. There are many ways to price carbon pollution. We can do nothing which is the status quo for parts of our economy and many parts of the world to do nothing. We can regulate and some regulations are important like um, fuel regulations and you know, the regulations for cars and the regulations for you know, whatever. There's all sorts of regulations that are, that are good and make sense. We won't go into that. There's been a ton of work on that. And if you ever need that research, we have it for you. Um, there's cap and trade. In certain circumstances, cap and trade is a, is a great idea, although it is very difficult for a national government to impose cap and trade in a federation because I don't think it's possible in Canada at the federal level for the government to control how much energy a, con a, a province or territory can consume or produce. So carbon pricing is pretty much the only way to do this. We can also subsidize energy, and I just like what to talk about that in three slides. So subsidizing energy, what it does is it um, disproportionately benefits the rich. So um, even clean energy, because the rich, uh, they are larger consumers of energy and worldwide, the richest 20% of households capture on average six times more fuel subsidies than the poorest 20%, making universal subsidies very inefficient policy for protecting poor households from fuel price increases, whether that be green energy, clean energy, or fossil fuels. Um, subsidies in general are expensive for governments and they can divert money away from much needed projects. So we dug deep early on in Canada into those numbers. But here's the international data, if you ever wanna refer back to it when you're speaking globally. This is from Oxfam. The richest 10% are responsible for almost half of the total lifestyle consumption for carbon emissions. And then in Canada in 2011, we started presenting to parliament that two thirds of Canadians directly emit average or less than average greenhouse gas emissions. This was based on the BC data and the richest 20% emit 1. times as much greenhouse gases, and the top 1% emits three times more than average and six more times more than the bottom 10%. So we've been sharing this data with parliamentarians for the past nine years. You don't have to memorize this, but just keeping in mind um, why we like carbon fee and dividend is because it, it actually rewards carbon conscious consumers, whether that be because you choose to be or economic circumstances require you to be. So there's two other ways to price carbon pollution. One is a carbon tax, money take, government puts tax on carbon pollution and gives, and then does stuff with the money. Um, in Canada, close to 50% of Canadians are within one paycheck of financial disaster. Probably not a good idea to tax them even more. So what we advocate or at Citizens Climate Lobby is carbon fee and dividend. This is probably the millionth time I've said it. Put a fee on carbon pollution and give all the money back to the people equally in dividend checks. But let's look at some images of this. So first of all, we know from many economic studies and case studies that policies that look close to the carbon fee and dividend policy are effective. And because they um, because 
they give money back to the people. It is good for the people. It gives money back to communities. It gives money back to people who are, you know, on the edge, which is almost 50% of Canadians. We know it's good for the economy. Almost all economies are going to do be going to do better in a, in a world where uh, carbon is priced. And those that are not, we need to just help them along. It should be a nonpartisan policy. It has something for everyone. For those who tend to be more progressive or left-leaning or socialist, the re reduction in income inequality should be very appealing to them. For those that are more libertarian, making the polluter pay should be appealing. It does not grow the tax base, which should be appealing to conservatives. And frankly, it's a centrist policy, which most Canadians are. Anyways, and that's because it's uh, revenue neutral. That means the government doesn't take any money. Just move something around here. I don't know why this is getting in the way. Okay. So this is our lovely crew in 2018. Um, we, at that point, we had gone to Parliament Hill 13 times. We have recorded what, almost 700 lobbying sessions with our parliamentarians, and we had almost 3,000 media hits. And while we were on the Hill, we were getting hints in October 2018 that the government was going to price carbon pollution, and it was going to be pretty close to what we had been asking for. And we're pretty happy. Doesn't that picture look like something out of, like, Sgt. Pepper's? Just saying. You know, the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. <laughs> and then, um, it's got that big circle in the middle. Um, and then Prime Minister Trudeau, two weeks later, announced it. That basically, he, they were going to do a carbon fee and dividend-like policy. That's not exactly how he said it. He used very carefully, careful language on the left there. You can go back and read it. Um, but we were really excited when that happened. This is the details of the, of the carbon pricing policy. So there's two components to it. So on the left here is the 2019 prices for it. I apologize, I don't have the 2020 prices there. I'm gonna have to update this slide actually. Um, so it's $30 a ton and those will all go up by uh, just a, about two cents more for gasoline and you know, up about two cents more for each of those. Um, anyways, so there's two components. There's a fuel consumption and heating fuel tax that is for most of the economy. That's for small and medium-sized businesses, uh, for basically all of our industries that are not emissions intensive trade exposed are heavy fuel emitters. Sorry, I'm getting some interference from my children. Okay, and then there's also the second component. And this part can get a little confusing um, and we can talk it over even more as we go forward, but it's called output-based carbon pricing. It was actually developed in, um, a lot of this was developed in Alberta and then um, Ontario, uh, the, the federal government took it over. Um, so what happens is there is a, an emissions intensive trade exposed industry and they register um, they register as they register their facility and based on their how well they've done reducing their emissions they pay a proportion of the fuel price so if they're really good industry they pay a much smaller carbon tax compared to their competitors who who don't so um, it sends a market signal. They don't pay the full fuel price, but it does keep them competitive and it does force them to reduce emissions. So that's our, that's our national backstop carbon pricing policy. Provinces of Alberta, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario have it. And so do the territories have par some parts or all of it. Okay, so this is, um, sorry, I'm going through this really quickly. It's going to get interesting and you can stop me if you have any questions. 
This just shows how important our carbon pricing policy is. Without it, our emissions go up. Plain and simple. This is, this is Canadian data. Our emissions go up. It's responsible for 80 to 90 megaton reduction between now and 2022. And you know that, that reduction is not good enough either. So we need more policies. This is Government of Canada data. And it, it is very critical that we have carbon pricing. And if you do go online and try like the PEMBA simulator or the on-road simulator, you'll find that Canada cannot meet its greenhouse gas emission targets without carbon pricing, but carbon pricing can't do it alone. So we focus on carbon pricing. Getting near the end of Canada. This is just a reminder that 80% of Canadians come out ahead. And you can go back and look at this data. Um, and if you lobby, uh, we highly recommend that you bring this sort of data with you. We're going to, to be developing a booklet for our May conference and lobbying days that are coming up. So you'll have a lot of this information in there. So don't feel like you have to memorize it. And we'll be reviewing this again on Monday, May 11th. And if you need more lessons about this, we're always available to do more training. I know this is very fast. Don't feel like you have to memorize it. It's all clickable. This looks complicated. All you need to know here is during elections, Citizens Climate Lobby Canada does not rank climate policies of the various political parties. What we do do is we, we objectively analyze their carbon pricing policies. This took us about five months to put together. Almost done. And then there was the election. And of the two thirds of Canadians, of the people that voted, two thirds of them voted for parties that had carbon pricing. Obviously we're a country a little bit divided and at Citizens Climate Lobby, we're gonna help build that, those bridges back up again because that's not a very pretty map right now for Canada. That's not good. We shouldn't be that divided. And do note that there was an ex exit poll and um, those that didn't, uh, those that voted, uh, voters, um, those that didn't vote conservative gave uh, the share plan a rating of D and 59% of people that didn't vote conservative said they supported a carbon tax. And it's always good to keep in mind that only 2% of Canadians belong to political parties. And the majority of us are just not faithful to one party. We, we, we vote shop. So politicians have to work hard for their votes. Now this is where it gets juicy and you can start asking questions now, but this is our carbon pricing timeline. So we worked from 2010 to 2015 to build political will alongside many other organizations. It was a tough haul. Um, we were met with a brick wall when it came to pricing carbon pollution from the previous government. But then Trudeau and the Liberals formed a government and they began the pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change. And at one point with the Vancouver Declaration, almost all provinces except for Saskatchewan signed on. And then there were a few elections that kind of fell apart. But anyways, on October 23rd, 2018, the federal policy was announced. And we got our dividends for those of us in provinces that, get, that have the federal carbon pricing policy. In March, when we filed, when we filed our carbon, um, when we filed the income tax, and then the fees began in 2019. They can do that because they know how much fossil fuels are going to be consumed in a year based on projections. Although I'm sure the 2020 projections are going to be quite off, given the COVID crisis. Also, um, in the national election, two thirds of people voted for parties with carbon pricing, and Trudeau got a minority government. Our next steps is to improve the national carbon pricing policy. And this is what we're going to be lobbying for. We want, no, we, we are demanding that the price must rise to $220 a ton by 2030. We want 
a line in our income tax. Most people don't know they received a rebate. Here in Ontario, the anti-carbon tax um, information has been really almost disturbing about how they're lying. It's whatever. Um, we need border carbon adjustments. We need national harmonization in order to get those border carbon adjustments because it will be really difficult without them. And we need our climate targets in a bucket list of accountability measures enshrined under national law. Slide. Just be a second here. So just to remember what we lobby for. We lobby for a fee on carbon pollution at the source, mine, well, or port of entry. 100% of the revenue is returned to households as a dividend. We would prefer border carbon adjustments. And don't worry so much about the limited regulatory adjustments. So that is simply what we lobby for. We're whipping through this, but it's going to get more interactive now. So Citizens Climate Lobby has seven values and each one of them it's really critical. And when you're forming your group or when you're getting a little confused or feeling unbalanced about the work you're doing, go back to our values and that will help you feel better. I still do this, but our values include focus. We're focused on a solution. We're focused on building political will locally. We have integrity. We do our best to speak the truth and seek out other ideas and be open to other ideas. We're optimistic. We truly believe that people are good. We embrace diversity. That's why we have a whole international wing now. Um, as you grow your group locally, your diversity um, should grow. We believe in all of you. We believe in you expressing your personal power in your way will change, it can totally change the world. It just takes one person. We are truly a relationships group. That's why we have so many conference calls a month so people can touch in and talk to other people. That's why we you know, don't demand that you do a whole bunch of things. We really just want you to mostly focus on developing a relationship with your member of parliament. And lastly, and most importantly, we are nonpartisan. It's all about relationships, respect, admiration, appeal to the best in others, and standing for something. So political will is the clear demonstration of support back home from citizens, business groups, faith groups, and local officials. It needs to be focused on specific steps and widespread. At Citizens Climate Lobby, we're betting the farm on all of you, on each and every one of you. In Canada, we will eventually get carbon pricing once it's cemented into our legislation, one riding at a time. And we rely heavily on you just building that local political will. And we'll give you as many tools as you need. And we know our methodology works because we've seen it work. Our mission is to empower people to have breakthroughs in exercising their personal or political power. Super key and central to the work we do is when you reach out to a per another person through the energy or creativity within you and that other person responds, you are exercising power. <laughs> when you make somebody else do something against their will, 
To me, that is not power, that is force. And force to me is the negation of power. Really critical, force is a negation of power. See those volunteers on the right? They had just come out from a meeting with the Canadian Embassy and they were supercharged up. I think it was 2016 and they just had built amazing relationships and got a whole bunch of help. So we're going to have a questions in a couple minutes. We're going to talk about the five levers of political will. And just a reminder that your primary job is to build a relationship with your local parliamentarians around carbon pricing. We're not a think tank, but we rely on think tanks help. So if you ever get good research or see, see a good seminar, tell us about it. Um, we're not a communications organization but we totally rely on communicators such as um, uh, George Marshall in, in the UK or Dr. Louise Camo here in Canada to guide us in how to communicate this more effectively. Um, if, you, if you ever want them to speak at one of our conferences or, or national calls, be sure to tell us, and, although they do have to be free folks. <laughs> um, and our niche is to build the political will locally for a national carbon fee and dividend policy. So our, we have five levers of political will and our number one job is the lobbying lever. And we're building a relationship with our members of parliament, send them our media releases, newsletters, open letters, invitations to our events, and try to attend their events too. They should get to know you by faith. Okay, finally got to a question. We're gonna take about five minutes to discuss something. Are you ready? And I'm gonna turn on my video. Okay, so you're going to lobby. That's the key thing you're going to do. And Early on at Citizens Climate Lobby, we used to lobby with the Climate Action Network and we used to go to all their events. So by the end of 2012, it became terribly obvious to us that citizen lobbying was very different from expert lobbying. And we love the Climate Action Network, but they're two very different types of lobbying. You are citizens, I'm a citizen, we're not experts. So think about it, and don't be afraid to be wrong, but think about it intuitively. We are citizen lobbyists, not experts. How do they differ? And what does that mean for you when you lobby? So you're going to lobby, you're not an expert, you're just a citizen. What do you think that means? Like, what would be your tactics? How is it, how would you approach it differently? How does it make you feel? Anyone? Anyone? Sure, I, I, you can't go wrong with being authentic and reasonably knowledgeable and interested in listening. Okay. So do you want to expand on that a little bit more just to help me out here? Well, I'm just thinking out loud because I'm new at this. I've written letters, but I've, I've never lobbied in person. I think it's, I look forward to building those relationships with my MLA and my MP in the coming months and years. And I'll have to explain to them what, number one, what I believe in and then find and tell them about what CCL is. I'm not sure how knowledgeable our MPs and MLAs are about CCL, especially in this neck of the woods, and then find some common ground. I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Would somebody want to add to that? No, I hear you totally. I think the, uh, 
the approach of a citizen versus an expert is really important because in a way it kind of plays more into their job security. Um, an expert might have an agenda or some form of, form of training. Whereas like when you approach a politician as a citizen, you are the person in charge of reelecting them so that they can continue to work. Um, and so you sort of have that, um, I don't want to say power over them cause that's, that's a little much, but you, you, you sort of have that angle as like, this is what you're supposed to be representing as opposed to like a special interest group or a group of experts. Yep. It's your right as a citizen to talk to your own politicians. That's why we always say only speak to your own politicians because no other politician needs to speak to you. Many politicians won't speak to you if you're not their own constituent. And yeah, you're right. We do have powers. We are, we are their constituents. We could, we, if we have enough social capital, have the power to affect the outcome of the next election, because that's how politicians exist from one election to the next. So the good side of that is if you build a healthy relationship and find that common ground that Victor was talking about, you can move forward together. You know, and you, it'll be stronger if you're nonpartisan. It'll be stronger if you use our value system. It'll be stronger if you don't try to force them or threaten them, but instead empower them. And we'll give you a few techniques how to do that. I'm talking too much. Come on, somebody else talk. <laughs> I was going to add to that. Um, in the same kind of vein, like you're not going to go in and tell them exactly what to do or give them advice on you should do this because you don't have that knowledge base to tell them what they should do, but opening the conversation to like maybe look into this and this is what we've collected so far and going forward with that can get the ball rolling. Yes, getting the ball rolling. Excellent, Brianna. Um, this is Allison. Maybe talking about uh, feelings I mean, facts are facts and figures and things like that are important, but maybe talking about your own motivations, how you feel and, and giving some examples from your friends in the neighborhood or something to kind of tell them the story and demonstrate that there are a lot of people who care about this. Yes, we have the power to give stories to them stories of their own constituents and they're there to serve constituents so that's a beautiful answer and yeah, feelings oh. go yeah go ahead uh the people like if you come forward as a citizen you have a bit of a bit of a personal level you show how it affects the day-to-day -day lives of their constituents and how it can affect them on a financial level as opposed to the financial needs of a you know a, a expert or a professional organization it has a bit of a uh, I think the politicians can kind of latch onto that emotionally a bit better and they might have a stronger uh, connection, a stronger desire to do what's best for their constituents as opposed to someone that comes to them day in, day out talking the same, you know, that someone that's their job to do it, right? Yep. It is their job. It is their job to, to protect us. And we, we, it's our job to bring those stories to them. Are there, are there other thoughts? Does this take the pressure off to know that you don't have to be an expert? Would anybody like to speak to that? I would say so, yeah. <laughs> From my perspective, that's part of it is always feeling like you have to know everything before you go in. If they ask you a question, you have to be able to answer it and yeah. You don't have to know everything. It's all good. Uh, it's Peter here. I, I would assume one thing you pretty well have to know is just the fundamentals of the issue, correct? I mean, we, I mean, yeah, we're all citizens, but <clears throat> if, if you're concerned about this, you, you, you need to know the fundamental issue here is that people are warming the planet and it's a big problem and we need to do something about it. Um, I'm, I'm quite honestly, I'm surprised that the tone that, experts have their own agenda. I 
we all have agendas, but I mean, the experts, especially on this issue, um, ultimately for most part of them, the good ones is communicating um, about the science. Um, I don't understand that why that is seemingly disparaged. You're the, a lot of a lot of conservative politicians don't believe it's real and believe that the science isn't real, and they believe that it's all a big hoax designed to. Take I fully under, I fully understand that, right? So how are you going to counter that by without bringing in some kind of understanding? I mean, your previous point was that we're just citizens. We don't need to be the experts. The experts have the agenda. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that you, you fundamentally have to be able to say to your conservative politician that this is a big issue. It's serious. Yeah. Uh, and the science indicates this. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have a little bit of a, a I, there was a, we're, we're speaking really quickly. The, the term experts, I think some people were, in my mind, when I hear people saying that some experts have an agenda, I think some people are thinking of the lobbyists that go in, the 4,000, 5,000 lobbying sessions that the oil and gas industry brings in there. Um, they have a little bit of an agenda um, that's not always. Yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. first and foremost, they are not the experts. Yes, um, you're right. Okay. You know what? I will reframe this question. So it's like, but at the same time, it, also, it's, you, you're not experts, but you bring expert advice. And we want our scientists, we want our politicians to listen to the experts as and well. It, this is Andy in Calgary. I wonder if I could say uh, one or two things. Um, one, I think is, uh, it's true we do not need to be experts, but we should be well informed and prepared to speak broadly about our issue. And on those occasions when we can't answer a question, that's not really a shortcoming, that's an opportunity because the correct answer in that case is, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. And that creates an opportunity for follow-up. Andy, uh, Peter, I'm gonna think hard about how I frame this question and I, I see your angle. Thank you. Any last questions or comments about this? I, I have, uh, I don't know if this is the right time. I have two questions. If, can I ask them at this time? If it's related to lobbying or if you think it might get to the point where we're going into the weeds and it might get to a little bit um, I talking about, we, we'll try and I'll, I'll, I, I will divert if, if necessary. Go ahead. Just correct me if I'm wrong. I believe both of my questions are related to lobbying. The first question is a short one. It's for you, Kathy. And the second question is for everyone. So my first question is, how did you come up with, uh, I already forgot it, the uh, fee and carbon fee and dividend. It's a fairly convoluted way to call a carbon tax. I can see why you want to avoid carbon tax, but why didn't you call it the revenue neutral carbon tax or revenue neutral carbon pricing? Because words are powerful. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, That's I, my we, first question. Yeah, I'll answer that right away. Yeah, one. yeah, I'll answer that right away. You have to name it something. And it was named a decade ago. It was named over a decade ago. In fact, there was a, who owns the sky? So yeah, I mean, I've been down this rabbit hole before. It's called carbon fee and dividend, just like cap and trade is called cap and trade. It's, it's actually got its own name now. So yeah, it's, it's what it is. I don't know why I got that name, but it, it just did. I didn't name it, but it is its name. Well, that's fine. It's important that we, as, as citizens, when we lobby, we all use the same words. So I, I get it. So my second question is, because we're, for the next 18 months, most many, if not most citizens and politicians are going to be very concerned with their health, with the economy, with their jobs. It's going to be maybe even more challenging to lobby them about climate change, won't it? Or is it an opportunity? So I'm throwing that question out to everyone. Um, that's something we can maybe try to answer at the end because that's going to be, that'll take us way off. But that's, we can't ignore the climate. 
we can't. So we just got to find the right angle and the right time with our own MPs. But we can get back to that at the end. I think that will take us too far off course. Thank you. For now. You're, thank you. No, it's a good question. And I, I want to leave that to the end. This is Allison just chiming in. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. About the, uh, the question around the word expert, it might, I was thinking it might be good to rephrase it as we are citizen lobbyists, not professional lobbyists. Uh, um, that to me is an important distinction. We, we may or may not be experts, um, but one assumes that professional lobbyists have all these facts and figures at their fingertips and they spend their whole days learning ways to push their agenda, which is different than kind of the idea of expert versus like expert in kind of like a scientific expert. So I don't feel like we have to feel the pressure to be professional lobbyists. I, I am going to be rewarding this question because I, I could see it triggers and I really appreciated your advice. And triggering is fine. Like, because when we, anytime we make somebody start thinking, then we should be paying attention to that. So thank you. Any last comments on this slide? Okay, so we do five things. We lobby, we work with media, um, we engage with our local media through letters to the editor, op-eds, we send them our media releases. If you still are lucky enough to have a newspaper, we're losing them left, right, and center. You try to meet with the editorial board and we work to place stories in all forms of media. Um, that young lady there, she is, I do believe from, the next riding over from you, Allison, and she came to one of our parties on Parliament Hill, and she was just going around to all the MPs and taking like these selfies and tweeting them up to them, and the, P the MPs loved it. So engaging with your members of Parliament through mainstream media or social media is a blast. Highly recommend it. Um, our grassroots outreach includes writing to parliamentarians, tabling at events, or giving presentations. Um, you know, th this can be a lot of work. And anytime I do outreach or I ask myself, how are my actions building political will locally? And it may or may not be directly for carbon pricing at the time. And here's an example on the right here. Citizens Climate Lobby Canada in 2018 got quite involved in an artistic project called Parachutes for the Planet. And we had, was it? yeah, we had a whole bunch of parachutes painted like this. And then we brought them to Parliament Hill and, and we brought them to pose with parliamentarians and we brought them out to our, in our community outreach. And it involved a lot of children and a lot of arts and a lot of connections with other community groups. And although we never really spoke about carbon pricing in many of our parachutes, what it did do was it helped build relationships. So um, and then so that's something to consider when you're doing your grassroots. Maybe not at all times you get to play the CCL carbon pricing card, but you're working with others, you're a team player, you're showing yourself as a, a climate leader in your community in, in general. So, but it's a lot of work. So think about it when you do it. Is it worth your time? Is it, is it helping you overall? Um, yeah, so that's the grassroots outreach that you could be doing to build political will. And then we also engage with community leaders, including businesses, religions, uh, not other NGOs. And, it, um, and you just build partnerships. And then you develop your chapter. Um, yeah, so, and you do that uh, with a, support the efforts with the four levers of building political well using the CCL way. And I just wanna make a note of caution. You know, here in Canada, we have a pretty healthy democracy and I've just found if you keep your groups small and then you have like groups around you that support you and groups around them that support you, um, but your small little group that you work with is focused on carbon pricing and then you work with others locally, um, it's, it's much better than to try to manage a, a large group all at once that's all over the map on the issue. So you, you may find it necessary to keep your 
just you'll be so focused on carbon pricing that um, generating a big large group directly involved with carbon pricing around you may not be possible and that's okay we're, we're a pretty healthy democracy in Canada you don't need a large group but then you can work with the other groups on other things around you um, I, just having these super large groups is really hard unless you're really good at it or you have a lot of time and just I just wanted to put that out there for developing your chapter if you only have two or three people working on carbon pricing that's okay um, and then you have people around you helping you that's okay like don't don't stress about how like having a big group that's that's not always like needed especially in Canada we've got a pretty healthy democracy um, I do highly recommend that you meet regularly you pick one time a month that you meet um, in at CCL there's a there's a Saturday meeting every month but note that most people don't um, most groups don't meet at that time most groups have their own monthly um, meetings here in Sudbury our monthly meetings are actually always action oriented we're always doing an action always we're doing some sort of outreach and then in that outreach we're we're having meetings and we probably have about three meetings a year to plan the whole year and then the rest of the year where our monthly meetings where we get together two or three times is to do actions what kind of actions oh uh, what kind of actions we we support our local fridays for future we support um uh we supported the um declaration of climate emergency in our community we were one of the communities behind that so that involved a lot of work uh, one of the community groups behind that this is stuff that we feel that will help build political will locally um we get involved in um movie nights with other organizations when they invite us we um during elections we help run town halls uh we we have our our letter to the other writing group stuff like that stuff that people are good at and want to do anybody have anybody have any other ideas okay and then we meet about two or three times a year to plan out the year just to make sure everybody's like on the same page because at the end of the day we are a community We also have laser talks. So if you're starting to read the monthly action sheets every month, you'll see that there's laser talks in there. And practice makes perfect. So we have our laser talk for, for carbon fee and dividend. With carbon fee and dividend, the government puts a price on carbon pollution. 100% of the dividends are returned back to the people. And a dividend, or, uh, either through a check or through a bank transfer, um, it's equal. And what that does is it sends a market signal, which will spur investment in clean energy and people will gravitate towards uh, Products that have less carbon in it. And that's how it is reduced. That's how carbon emissions are reduced. That's a typical laser talk. You use your own words and you'll see them in the action sheets every month. If you're reading them and that's okay if you're not yet. So at the very beginning, I said the most important thing you do is lobby your member of parliament and sorely that's got member of Congress in there. I have to change that. And then you have all the other things around you, but the most important thing you're doing is lobbying. And then if you have time and energy and people helping you, all those other things can develop. So now we're going to go towards lobbying, but are there any questions about about doing about developing your chapter your monthly meetings just getting this going any thoughts can i just ask a question about the uh, the 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 trudeau uh policy I, you seem to indicate it that that it meant your sort of carbon fee and dividend requirements but it's the, the trudeau policy certainly isn't 100 percent neutral so how do you how do you um, re respond to that when, when you meet with an MP or anybody, really? Um, it's 90% of the revenue is returned directly to households. 10% go to municipalities, hospitals, and um, places where they can't really absorb the cost. So um, where it's just not possible. 90% so, is distributed? Really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
it's 90%. Hmm. Nine, so the government, so your federal, your provincial government in Alberta will get a lump sum and they're supposed to distribute 90% of that back to the citizens directly. And then 10% can be for like hospitals, schools, municipalities who can't, um, absorb the capital costs of what is happening. So in the, in the transition or whatever, I probably use the wrong financial term. So yeah, if you look it up and we, sure. when we do it, when we practice our lobbying, I will show you, um, I will show you that the, the lobbying, well, I sent a lobbying, what are, what are we considered our lead behind, but are, are there more questions? That's a good question. Okay, so we whipped through this really quickly. I'm just gonna uh, going to do something shortly. So, lobbying, it's a blast. It's like jumping out of an airplane. And probably most of you do it naturally anyways. Um, we're Canadian, we're friendly, our politicians are friendly. We're really lucky we get to meet with them face to face. But when you're doing an actual lobbying meeting, um, there are some general guidelines, which we like to use. Um, these are the main roles in a meeting. So make sure everybody has a role. Make sure everybody knows their role. So the appreciator is somebody who appreciates something that the politician has done lately. The time monitor keeps track of the time. The note taker takes the notes. There's people that'll be involved in various discussion points. You might have somebody who's okay with talking about border carbon adjustments and put face carbon pricing. You might have another person who's really good about talking about carbon fee and dividend or another person who's really good at talking about citizens climate lobby. And then you have the asker. And we have very specific asks that you're going to ask your politician and you figure out what's the ask. There's, there's six of them we think. It might be condensed down to five. There's going to be six asks this year. That'll be clear in a moment. And you figure out which are the most important ones to ask your member of parliament. There's also the deliverer. You may have petitions you, you've gotten people to sign or cards or any sort of information that the politician has asked for. You may have somebody bring that. You make sure you have somebody do the follow-up and you have a photographer. And then you should have an observer, somebody who's watching what's going on, making sure that the, the conversation is staying in on the rails. This is uh, one more thing, one more thing to learn and then you're going to practice. Anybody here heard of motivational interviewing before? Anyone? So what motivational interviewing is, it's derived from uh, therapy sort of interviewing done primarily with people with addictions issues to help them understand their behaviors because you can't tell people what to do, can't present people with facts to get them to change their behavior. So you ask, you ask questions to help them uncover their own roadblocks so that you can move forward, you can help them move forward. So the same idea is with helping our politicians with carbon pricing. We need to, or aspects of carbon pricing. We need to ask them questions, not tell them what they need to do, but ask them questions about why and not why, about how or who or what or where or when about carbon pricing that they need to consider. Now, if, you've, if you have been granted a lobbying session, then you have already received permission to lobby your member of parliament. And what you need to do is you go in and you, you know, you do your introductions, your appreciation, and then you ask them, you know, for specific parts of the carbon pricing policy that you'd like them to think about. And then you ask how, who, what, when, or where, but don't ask why questions because why questions get philosophical. So let's say you're going to lobby a, um, a conservative 
and you kind of done your research and don't be surprised everyone actually most conservatives that i've ever lobbied do believe that climate change is real and a threat they just they just have this roadblock with carbon pricing currently so you know ask them who are you getting your information from what is the information you have where did you get it when did you get it you know how, how who have you talked to you know, so you can start uncovering where they're getting their information from and then saying, you know, would you be open to getting our information? You know, here's, you know, so you just, you, and your goal is to actually get the member of parliament talking um, more. Um, in fact, you're uh, more than you would expect. In fact, they should be doing most of the talking. And your goal is to ask as many good questions when you're lobbying them. You know, our, uh, especially as a boomer myself, our default position is to lecture, but that's not what we do when we lobby. We go in and we try to ask really good questions to help uncover things like who could you work with if you have an NDP or liberal, you know, uh, who in the house is helpful, you know, who on the other side of the aisle is like doing the right things. Can we, you know, those sorts of questions. So any questions about motivational interviewing? Okay. So we're going to role play for a few minutes. But in a meeting, there's a basic meeting outline, there's a beginning. So thanks, how much time do we have? Introductions, appreciation, state our purpose and ask. Then there's the middle part where you're exchanging thoughts, you're asking those motivational questions, you're listening for values, you're trying to move the member forward towards, you know, wherever they are on the spectrum of carbon pricing and climate change and getting them closer to what we feel is the best sort of carbon pricing policy and then end with a clarifying or supporting ask. So I have to change my screen shortly. Just give me a second here. But are there any questions at this point? Any questions? Okay. No questions. No questions. Okay. We have 20 minutes left and want you to think about practicing a lobbying session. And what I'm probably going to do is randomly put you out into do two breakout rooms. And I hope to be able to share my screen. Hope this works. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So what this is, is our lobbying ask. And, okay, it's looking pretty good. All right, and um, what we have here is a description of citizens climate lobby, the urgency, the progress, and all the information that we think is important to share here on the left. We don't really talk about that. That's just for reference for the politician and for you as well to just, you know, to maybe try to get those points across carefully if you can while lobbying, but it's not necessary, but so they know how urgent the situation is and, you know, um, and that we are, and that carbon pricing is supported by a lot of people. But really what you're trying to do is you want to sit down and you say, okay, I'm with Citizens Climate Lobby. We are in an urgent situation. In the past four years, we've made a lot of progress and we're pushing towards net zero by 2050. And the good news is, if we, is if we uh, enact an, a carbon fee and dividend policy as a core component of a cost-effective climate plan, we can help save lives, improve health, et cetera, and many, economists around the world support this and we are also world leaders and 
you know, even the post media edi editorial board at the National Post um, endorses this, this sort of carbon pricing policy. And we appreciate the Greenhouse Gas P Pollution Pricing Act. Um, and we are world leaders, but these are, this is what we'd love to see in our upcoming carbon pricing policy. Now, there are a lot of asks there. So I suggest you start with number one. Say, so we would like, based on the evidence that we can give you, and it's on the left-hand side here, we'd like to see the national carbon pricing policy increase to at least $220 a ton by 2030. What are your thoughts about that? You know, try to try to get them on that subject, and then they might say, "Well, why two hundred and twenty dollars a ton?" And you know, you can see over on the left-hand side that it, this well, in, and you'll have talking points is that this is the recommended value in order to get closer to our to our Paris Agreement, um, and it must be revenue neutral. Okay, so let's say they agree, or let's say your group really just wants those climate action incentive rebates, and you, you don't care, you don't want to worry so much about the the, the actual price your group actually loves the rebates and you just want to lobby your politician about those rebates. So you can pick one of these points. Um, I highly recommend you stay away from the output based pricing system unless you want to get super wonky um, and you have somebody else uh, there with you. And we also, if you, if that, you know, if you think all of these are going to fail, no matter what, like all of these asks, we have a sixth ask. And we are demanding a framework for cross-party cooperation through legislation of science-based greenhouse gas targets and successive term GHG budgets with mandatory public reporting um, to meet those targets and budgets. How do you feel about working in parliament about that if all of those fail, right? So, so you go to lobby, you generally have this sheet in front of you and if you're gonna be lobbying virtually, you're probably gonna have it up on a screen or you're gonna refer your member of parliament to it. And then your group, you don't ask for all of it. You just ask for one or two of these. Or maybe if you're lucky, you can zip through all of them. Maybe they'll give you an hour and a half to discuss all of these. But if you're only given 15 minutes, you know, prioritize. So um, any questions about this lead, what we call the lead behind, or it's a draft version of our federal lobbying ask. We have to run this through a few people. But any questions or comments about this? You actually got an endorsement from the National Post? We got, an we got an endorsement from the Post Media Editorial Board. Did they actually yeah. print it or did they send yeah. you a note? No. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. In the, yeah, Carbon Fee and Dividend has been endorsed repeatedly by the Post Media Editorial Board. You can go look it up and I can get you those links. Or do I have it there? Maybe I should. No, I don't see a link, but I would sure yeah. love to see a link <laughs> okay i will make sure that this final thing has all the links but yeah it was really super exciting to to get that from the post media editorial board okay there, there is uh, good news I, i'm going to look at that link as well yeah it's not there right now i realize it's not on there which is really surprising so i i'll have to go back to an old one and i'll i'll put that on my my notes to to to, to update that and I'll send you all the updated link. That'd be great. I have a question, Kathy, about, mm -hmm. uh, so you've been doing this in, for a while and some of the chapters have been active for years, right? Yeah. So in their experience, when they have approached parliamentarians or even uh, perhaps uh, MLAs as well, and in case where they approached conservatives who maybe don't see don't see carbon pricing in the same light what what uh, how do you handle it if they they basically think well I, I'm not sure this might hurt the Canadian economy because the Chinese and the Americans are not doing very much do you ever get those uh, kind of Oh, all the time, all the time. And you can, um, you know, if you want me to be on that first call or um, meeting. No, no, I'm just asking. Yeah. You okay. Experience. So, yeah, it, yeah, definitely. We always get it's going to hurt the economy and, and it's, well, doing nothing for the climate will hurt the economy. And 
The Pemina simulator and the on-road simulator show that we can't meet our Paris agreements without pricing carbon. That's not the only thing we need to do, but it, we have to do that. And it's, it's part of the package. And um, we owe it to our children to listen to the experts. And um, yeah, I mean, just, you just in the moment, you have to you know, gauge your relationship with your member of parliament. Of course. And, yeah. yeah. No, Anybody got some re replies for that? Because you're you all deal with because a lot of you have conservatives. I know Allison, and and um, Brianna, and everybody here on this call. I, I think except for uh, Sheldon and myself have <laughs> conservatives. So, any thoughts on that? Anyone? Sandy. Yeah, I just want uh, you know what I get with uh, with my MP Michelle Rempel is that. You know, regulation is the way to go. We and that's and I I'm so tempted to say uh, that's that's the policy platform. But what 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 do you think personally? Yes. And, and I know that she does believe that climate change is an issue, but every, and I'm I'm sort of stuck because every time I speak with her, which has only been three or four times, she just keeps going back to that uh, talking point. And I say, well, would you, you know, consider, well, it won't work in Alberta. And you guys get your stats from, I don't know where, somewhere in the States. And it won't work here because we have, you know, rural people way up north and they're not going to, it's going to hurt their uh, whole livelihood. I don't, I don't know how to get unstuck. That's really good. And I like how you don't argue. Because at CCL, we don't argue. So other thoughts? So uh, how about asking, would you like to see more evidence? Or how about saying Canadians for Clean Prosperity under Mark Cameron came out with all these excellent papers and now Mark Cameron is the economic advisor to Jason Kenney. So, <laughs> and they fully supported carbon pricing. Did you know that? <laughs> Did you? Yes, yeah, so a little bit confused about how Albertans are not getting carbon pricing when the premier's own economic advisor is a carbon pricing champion. So maybe uh, we recommend you go speak with Mark. <laughs> and Mark used to be the policy advisor to Stephen Harper in 2009. Like just start, yep. So, and you have this all recorded and I'm getting thumbs up from Sandy there. So. The idea is not to argue and try not to sound snide like maybe I just did, like really do it with love in your heart. So, and if I sounded snide, I apologize. I was actually trying to be joking, but it can come across wrong. So yeah, and if you need to rehearse um, and you need more talking points, like call me beforehand. Been there, done that before, and you have each other too. So any other questions or comments? So we have five minutes, five minutes to practice a lobbying session. So how can we do this? Yeah. I think if I put you into two groups and you quickly assign yourself roles, I think you can do this. Give me a second. I'm going to switch screens here. All right. So I'm going to try to put you into two groups if they'll let me. And oh, nope, I can't divide you out on this one. I don't know what just happened. Okay, so technically I've messed myself up here. Okay, so how about if I give you each a rule, do you think you can do this? Are you ready? Okay, hold on. My, yes. My screen is freezing. Okay, hold on. There we go. So I'm gonna give you each a rule. And I'm just gonna go down my screen. So, Peter, I'm going to be 
uh, a conservative from Alberta, any MP. We won't, we won't mention it. You're just going to pretend to appreciate something I've done lately. Just make something up. Victor, you're going to ask how much time we have. Sandy, okay. yep, Sandy, you're going to think one particular ask from that document. Um, oh, no. Yeah, you're going to think of one particular ask from that document that you think would you best like to, to do with me, like to ask of me. Um, Sheldon, you're going to do the like introduction about Citizens Climate Lobby. Just say, hey, we're from Citizens Climate Lobby. We're so happy to meet with you today. Um, and and then we'll just try to get the discussion going with everyone else. So try to think of questions that you would like to ask me. Um, Sandy, since I put you on the spot, what do you think you're going to ask of me as a, as a, what's, what, what, what particular thing are you going to ask of me with this? With the with these asks, which one? If you were to meet with a conservative, which one? You're, you're muted, dear. I would likely ask about what the opinion was on increasing the carbon price to two hundred and twenty dollars uh, by twenty thirty. What do you Sounds think? About that? What are your thoughts on that? Let's just do it. Let's just do it. It's gonna be fun. So does yes, everybody? Yep, so I'm, I'm a conservative and we're going to pretend you're lobbying me over the internet and you're all going to try to ask a question of me once we get through the brief introductions, the appreciation, how much time do we have, and Sandy asking. Are we ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, that, so it opens with Peter and then Victor asking how much time and then I think it was Sheldon, you're just saying we're here with Citizens Climate Lobby and then Sandy's gonna do the, the ask. And then y'all ask questions. Here we go. Me to start? Yep, Peter, that'd be you. Okay, Mr. Jenner, um, I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time with us. I know you're willing to listen to uh, all sides of the uh, of the of an issue. I recently spoke to uh, Heather McPherson from uh, from Edmonton Strathcona, and she said you are definitely a person that will take the time uh, to look to see what the other ha side has to say uh, about a particular issue. time do we have so if it's my turn I thank you for meeting us today um how much time uh, do you have to talk about this issue with us today i'd like to take a full hour i'd really like to really discuss this thank you uh thanks for giving us your time and uh i just like to introduce us we're from citizens climate lobby and we're a uh, citizens advocacy group to lobby for a uh, carbon uh or a uh, I'm mixing the words up here. A, uh, it's the uh, the term that's not a carbon tax. It's a the the, the fee and dividend. Yeah, the carbon fee dividend, uh, revenue neutral carbon fee dividend for uh, all Canadians. Sandy. Hi. Um, thanks again for meeting us. Um, I have an ask, and the ask is. Would you consider looking into the having the carbon price rise to $220 by 2030? We have a lot of supporting evidence to to uh, support this that you could you publicly you could take a look at. At this point, you're showing the door. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. But remember, you're constituents, so it's your right to be here. Um, oh. Yes, yes. Yeah, so. Uh, Wow, that's a huge ask. You went right out on a limb here, knowing full that the, the the Conservative Party does not support carbon pricing. So, that no, not not currently. Have, no, I wouldn't. But let's discuss this more. Yes, we do certainly have evidence to support our ask. What 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 sort of evidence? Well, we have the sheet that you just had earlier. <laughs> This is where, you know what, this is where I have to say, this is why going in in a group is uh, it's so nerve-wracking when you, if you ever have to do by yourself. But if you have 
a group, two or three people, it, it surely makes a difference when you get a question. I, I know Andy and I have been uh, in several meetings and it's just so much easier. Andy, could you, uh, could you help me support the question? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared either. In an ordinary lobby session, I would commit some of these facts to memory before I go in. And I, I just saw the 2020 draft a few minutes ago and I don't have it in front of me. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but try to ask me questions to get me to open up. So it's, you don't have to present the facts. You're trying to get me to open up. Like, so go for it. I think uh, Allison wants to say something. I'll just say, well, why, why do you think that that price is unreasonable? Um, what, do you, what do you think is a path um, that we could take to achieve the reductions that, that we need? Like what kind of price point do you think um, would work? Those are good questions. Okay, um, so I have to pretend I'm conservative. Um, well, the path that the conservatives see is regulation. We've never really, uh, we don't really support carbon pricing. So uh, no, there's no price point. We regulation is the way forward. So ask me where my evidence is from, somebody. <laughs> so how do you get your evidence from? There we go. So yeah, so you start, so uh, well, we, uh, yeah, so you, you're not challenged. It was very nice. So, so they say something and then I'm trying to, well, we've spoken with uh, this certain group and they have, you know, given us this evidence and then you would might say, I don't know, what else could you say to that? So I know I'm not very good at acting. I wish I was my daughter. Well, I would say I'm really glad that you are for regulations because it, carbon pricing alone cannot achieve the reductions that we need. We need re regulations as well as carbon pricing. Um, we are here on behalf of, of a carbon fee and dividend. And I want to say that I, I think that this policy uh, benefits um, people from all um, areas of Canadian society. I know that um, some politicians in Alberta have expressed worry uh, about uh, rural households, but in fact, the carbon fee and dividend will give them more than they pay in carbon tax. And it seems like a way forward that helps everybody and helps to supplement the regulatory framework that your, that your party is pushing for. So I feel these things can work together really well. That was excellent. Okay, so I'm getting excited about what I'm hearing. Anybody else want to add something and see how it's great working in a group? Any last question or comment you'd like to make to me as the conservative from Alberta? Because this is excellent. Well, I believe we all want the same thing to, to reduce carbon emissions and have a better future for the next generation. And, and uh, we would like to explore how uh, your government's policy could could achieve this, uh, not just in the short term, but in the long term. That was excellent. None of you argued. None of you preached to me. None of you info bombed me. I heard active listening, like you're, you're actually hearing what I was saying and reflecting it back to me. And then moving forward, you were finding common values, common ground. That's how we do it. You already know how to do this. You really do. So how are you feeling? Well, it's a great start. I mean, we haven't even been out there yet. I, I, <laughs> I imagine we would get better with time. Mm -hmm. And you can support each other. No, um, you've got a bunch of people from Alberta here. So maybe um, you can support each other, you know, within Alberta. If you ever need my help, I can lobby with you. Same with you, Allison. You have a bunch of people in Abbotsford, in Vancouver, that can help you if you if you don't feel comfortable yet about lobbying alone. But I'm sure they would they would scoot out to Surrey in a heartbeat. That's so, 
And Sheldon, you got it easy. You got Siemens over there. So. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what do you do if your MP is just way, you're, it's just way too easy? What do you do then? If he's well, just then, all for it. Yeah, so if they're all for it, then you try to get, like, talking points from them um in common ground how how we can like keep building political will locally so we can keep pushing it farther and harder and how can we push it regionally so you know yeah you 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 have that whole area to work with so yeah you just keep expanding and just keep growing your conversations there perfect I think it's important to remind your MP even if they're all for it right now it's probably important to remind them regularly that that people are still behind this. Everyone can second guess themselves and, and I'm sure the MPs are under a lot of pressure. So just reminding them about what people care about is good. Wise words. Yep. Very wise words. We're closing up, we're two minutes over. This was really good. As you just talk about thank you for all the stuff that you do and all the you're, you're just such an inspiration to see, uh, you're, you just never give up. I love that. Never surrender. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Anyways. Kathy. You're a good role model. And uh, Peter and Matthew and I will uh, get together. And if you need my help or anyone's help, we're, we're, we're here to help you um, for sure. And are, have you all registered for the conference on May 11th? It's going to be online. It's going to be awesome. It's, uh, it includes um, Jason Dion, who is the climate uh, mitigation research chair for the climate, oh, no, I'm forgetting the name, but the, organ the organization that's advising parliament directly. Then we're going to have Salim Bach from Analytica Advisors talk to us about the very intricate financial issues that Canada is facing with fossil fuel investments, mm. important to know. And then we're gonna have a legal panel with Dr. Diane Sachs, who's gonna take us on a world tour about the over thousand uh, climate uh, litigant uh, cases on the planet right now um, and what they all mean and what, what are some of the good ones. And then we're gonna zero in on the Ontario case against uh, Premier Doug Ford with the Eco Justice team and Note that two of the seven plaintiffs are CCLers, and one of them is my daughter. <laughs> so, and lastly, we're going to do going to do carbon pricing around the world, so you can get a real feel for it. things are moving forward on this planet. Like, like, and the world is looking to Canada. So it's going to be amazing. What's the date again? Monday, May eleventh. Just look through your many emails that you get from me. You got one from me today. And it's online. It's right on the homepage of the Canadian website. Any last comments from anyone who hasn't spoken much? So, Brianna, love to hear your voice. Any uh, my only question was actually about the, um, the rendezvous. Is it gonna be just during the day? Yeah, like, you'll probably be working, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Though. Is it going to be recorded at all? or? Yes, it will oh, be okay. recorded. Okay. It's, and with luck, we'll get it online. Okay. I just, I advise you to watch it live because um, sometimes we have technical failures. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, I'll keep an eye out for it, yeah. Okay, Brianna, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for all you're doing. I just, this is so exciting to activate Lethbridge, St. John's and Surrey and to reinvigorate Calgary and Edmonton. This is beautiful. And our dear friends in Wolfville put their family first and kudos to her and them. You know, this is family first always. Missed stop recording. <laughs>